only 13 years old when I decided to dedicate my life to study and protect manta rays. I still remember that afternoon. I was sitting in our half-shaded living room, watching a documentary about these magnificent creatures. I learned how much manta rays were endangered, exposed to uncontrolled fishing in many parts of the world, and how little we knew about them, basically nothing. I decided I would study to protect them. My parents thought I would grow out of this idea, but that didn't happen. This mission was even more strange, since I was born to a poor family in a landlocked country, Hungary, without much resources. In addition, as a kid, I was extremely shy. I didn't believe in myself at all. Oftentimes, still, I don't believe in myself. But for some reason, I felt my mission was to find out more about manta rays. I'm here today because a friend of mine believed in me and pushed me to talk here. Years ago, this friend gave me a stone with an inspiring word carved on it. Since then, if I have difficult times ahead of me, that stone helps and inspires me when I look at it, so I couldn't say no to the request of this friend. So I'm here to introduce you to these amazing creatures, the manta rays. During the last 20 years, I tried to think with their brain, see with their eyes, and be in their skin. The most common question I get about manta rays is how intelligent are they? Scuba divers who dove with them are convinced they are intelligent. Sometimes they let divers, sometimes they let divers to cut fishing lines off their bodies. And often, they just curiously approach the divers. Seems like looking for some kind of interaction. But how can we compare their intelligence to our intelligence? Looking at their brain seemed like a good starting point. I was invited to join an expedition in Mexico in 2001 to collect uh, mobile array tissue samples that are close cousins of manta rays. And I had access to manta ray brains from existing collections, so finally I could start studying their brain. Some researchers think that the brain weight to body weight ratio is a good predictor of intelligence. These polygons show the brain weight to body weight ratio of species in, in, of species in four vertebrate groups, and the dark polygon is for the cartilaginous fishes, where sharks and rays belong to. So where do mantas and mobulas fit in this picture? I found that their brain was larger than it can be expected by their given body mass, and they extended the upper boundary of the cartilaginous fish polygon, overlapping many mammals and exceeding most birds and bony fish species. Other researchers think that only the size matters, and larger brain means higher intelligence. Manta rays score well in this test, too. I found that they have the largest brain of all fish species studied so far. This is especially surprising, since, for example, whale sharks, with similar lifestyle and feeding strategy, have about 10 times larger body weight but their brain is only the third of the manta rays. Other, re other researchers uh, describe that the glial cell to neuron ratio is a good predictor of intelligence. Glial cells are cells in the brain that have many functions, including support and help of information processing between neurons. According to our current knowledge, in the human brain, 10% of the cells are neurons, and 90% of the cells are glial cells. Mobulas had much more glial cells in three brain regions I measured than even a domestic cat, a shark, or a turtle species. Did you know that Albert Einstein's brain was found to differ from other human brains, only that he had more glial cells? The forebrain of manta rays the part of the brain that is considered to be responsible for cognition or personality is greatly enlarged, 
taking up more than 60% of, of the brain weight. And their visual information processing area is surprisingly enlarged as well. I was wondering, what monitor is used their huge brain for if a whale shark can get away with a much smaller one? And why do animals living and feeding in plankton-rich waters need good visual abilities? I believe we need to study an animal as a whole system if we want to better understand them, not just one aspect of it. So I started behavioral observations and experiments. The common belief is that fish are dumb. I was curious how dumb is the potentially most intelligent fish, at least based on its brain characteristics. But how do we measure the cognitive abilities of a manta ray or any fish at all? There is a universally accepted test that measures whether a species has self-awareness or self-recognition. This Miro test was developed by Gallup in 1970, and only a few species passed it so far. For example, some apes, African elephant, magpie, or the bottlenose dolphins. The common characteristics of these species are the relatively large, well-developed brain, and highly social behavior. During this test, the animal is first exposed to the mirror, and if it shows social reaction, aggression, or looks behind it, it is unlikely that the animal has self-awareness. But if it shows self-inspection by doing repetitive, unusual movements front of the mirror, it might suggest self-awareness. At this point, a visible mark is applied on one side of the body, and if the animal exposes that side to the mirror more often than any other side, it would suggest self-inspection or self-awareness. For example, bottlenose dolphins did unusual repetitive turns and blue bubbles front of the mirror that was interpreted as self-inspection or self-awareness. So I thought, if mantaris have the largest brain of all fish, then probably they have the ch best chance to pass the mirror test, if any fish can at all. So it might sound strange at first, but we actually exposed captive manta rays to a mirror, and we experienced something unexpected. The manta rays not only spend much more time in front of the mirror than without the mirror or with only a whiteboard, but they also exposed their belly to the mirror repeatedly. And somehow, they also created bubbles in front of the mirror, similarly to what was observed with dolphins. Does it really mean they are self-aware? Does it really mean they have good cognitive abilities and they are not so dumb? I can't answer these questions yet, but I'm very excited to continue these experiments. The common belief is that the body coloration of manta rays is permanent over the lifespan of the individual. Their body coloration is even used for distinguishing Monterey species. In addition, identification photos are collected worldwide that rely on the spot ma markings on their belly, which photos are used to count individuals, to estimate their population size. For many years, while making observations on wild animals, I was rather curious about the white markings on their back, which seemed very variable as well. Years later, when I was making observations on captive animals, I suddenly faced a surprising discovery. Before the Monterey feeding started, I had to stop my experiments, but I stayed around to watch the feeding, and I couldn't believe my eyes. The Monterey's had very intense, rapid coloration changes. The animal that was almost completely black most of the day, an hour later, had beautiful, white, intense markings on its head and on its back. And this happened at every feeding event and during intense social interactions on more animals. In spite of many years of research in the wild, these changes couldn't be detected. 
Is it a hormonal response connected to excitement? Is it part of their visual communication? Or does this rapid coloration change help them in some way during feeding? So many possible explanations that need to be tested. These manta rays didn't stop surprising me. Nine months later, I went back to continue my uh, observations. And I thought a new animal was in the tank. But it turned out it was the same. It just changed its coloration on its head and on its belly. What if the markings that we assume to be permanent are actually changing? and the different coloration stages are considered as separate individuals in the wild. What if we have less manta rays than we think, and the populations are even smaller than researchers estimate them worldwide? What if the specimen we thought belongs to a certain species? is maybe a developmental stage of another species. More I know about them, more questions I have and the answers can change the future of manta rays. But if we don't act fast, they won't be found in our oceans. At many parts of the world, manta rays are killed by people who are fishing for their survival because they don't have other chance to survive or to support their families. Manta rays have very low reproductive rates. It is very slow or impossible for targeted populations to recover. Although they are legally protected in a few countries, and the international trade of Monterey parts are going to be more strictly controlled in the next year, they are still vulnerable for extinction. Illegal fishing and trade within countries still continues and marine protected areas often don't create sufficient boundaries for migrating manta rays or dedicated fishermen either, especially when the demand for dried manta ray gill rakers are high in Asian markets. The idea of the Manta Memories project was born when I was making observations on captive animals and I was taking photos, and tourists wanted to buy Monterey photos from me to take home as souvenirs. Less than a year later, the Manta Memories project was started to establish an alternative income option to those communities who now have to rely on Monterey fishing and trade because they don't have other choice. So the Manta Memories project was started to help them create Monterey-related souvenir items and handicrafts, which will be available at Monterey-focused tourist destinations, this way generating additional income to these communities. Similar asset-based community development projects are successfully present worldwide that build on the skills of local residents and on the power of local organizations to help them recognize their own ability to help and build their own sustainable local economy. The first distribution center of the Manta Memories items was opened in Fiji at the beginning of this month. And they will support the most critical Manta Ray fishing communities in Indonesia. While I was in Fiji, to set up the distribution center and a new research project. I visited a poor village elementary school with especially underprivileged kids. When walking through the school, I suddenly felt ashamed that I thought my life started with unfairly limited resources. I talked to them about my story and my love and dedication to Monterey's and they drew beautiful Monterey drawings for me in return. Maybe they didn't speak perfect English. Maybe they were shy. Maybe they didn't believe in themselves. 
but I could see in their eyes that they were full of dreams. I hope I could convince them that it worth to dream big, to think outside of the box sometimes, if necessary, to fight against difficulties. I wish they will all have a friend in their lives who will give them a stone like mine with the word believe written on it. Thank you.